Amen. I thought, I think you, uh, if you saw my, this weekly's newsletter and blog link, uh, that um, I was hoping we could have about four people who can join me to make sure that we move these eight tables back to where they belong. The seating can stay like that, um, and uh, I'll take care of it during the week. Um, no big deal, and we shall be good. I want to read today's lesson found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 36 to 44. This is the uh, lesson, gospel lesson for the lectionary for this first Sunday in Advent. And I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. This is, this is, this is a, a beautiful gospel lesson because I think it sets up for the rest of the Advent Sundays that lead us to that glorious Christmas morning. But about that day and hour, no one knows. Neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. For as the days of Noah were, so will be the coming of the Son of Man. For as in the days before the flood, there were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day Noah entered the ark and they knew nothing until the flood came and swept them all away. So too will the coming of the Son of Man. Then two will be in the field, one will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding meal together. One will be taken and one will be left. Keep awake, therefore, for you do not know on what day your Lord is to come. But understand this. If the owner of the house had known in what part of the night the thief was coming, he would have stayed awake and would not have left his house be broken into. Therefore, you also must be ready for the Son of Man coming at an hour that you do not expect. This is the reading and the written word of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. As you are aware, today is known in the Christian liturgical calendar as the first Sunday of Advent. The four Sundays before Christmas. The word Advent comes from the Latin word Adventus, meaning coming or visit. It's New Testament Greek version. I'm hearing sounds from heaven. <laughs> it's New Testament Greek version is the word parousia, parousia. A word scattered, by the way, if you notice in the reading in several places in the gospel for today, where Jesus is speaking and talking about something that most of us, it would just over our heads. But not for Jesus, nor the disciples, nor the audience to which he was sharing these fascinating words. For millions of Christians around the world, today is the beginning of the four Sundays that lead us to that Christmas morning. I love Dietrich Bonhoeffer on his view of Advent. Let me quote him. He says, the celebration of Advent is possible only to those who are troubled in soul who know themselves to be poor and imperfect. I raise my hand. And who look forward to something greater to come. There is the word parousia or parousia or adventus or advent, the coming of something. During Advent, we're reminded of the glorious story of the first coming of Christ 
as the baby Messiah while anticipating a second coming of Christ coming to establish, and I'm going to use these theological, a theological framework here. It's not, we don't really know how that looks like. We think we do, but no, we don't. To establish a divine experience of fullness for all humankind. When we don't know. How, we're not sure. Where, we'll never know. It's undetermined, it's unknown, and it's unspecified. What we do know of the second advent, like there was a first advent, there shall be a second advent, is that its final outcome, at the end of it all, the vision of that, that experience of a second coming, is noted in the beautiful words and the this this just really unusual book known as the book of revelations chapter 21 where the writer speaking or or addressing or alluding to this return of this glorious christ someday unknown undetermined unspecified writes the following look God's dwelling is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them, and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death, or mourning, or crying, or pain, for the older order of things has passed away anything we come up with any scheme religious and theological liturgical anything about this final glorious outcome or event is is pure speculation at best and fantasy at worst let me explain for most christians Today's scripture lesson is a peculiar reading. I've been a pastor for 30 years in ministry and a Navy chaplain and even three years of ministry in hospice, which I loved and formed and shaped my ministry around pastoral care. And to this day, when I read this kind of material in the Bible, I still am fascinated by it. I'm fascinated by it because of what it has become in the minds of very creative religious people. It's a peculiar reading. A part of that peculiarity is because it's often interpreted in uber-literal fashion, devoid of its historical sourcing and literary form. In its worst misuse and abuse, the lesson and similar lessons in the Bible, throughout the Bible, that sound like this, something about the son, the, 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 uh, son of God or son of man, something about uh, establishment of the kingdom, uh, something, it, it's just, it's just, it's a fascinating idea. But it's in our holy scriptures and texts and we cannot avoid it. It's often used, this kind of language in the Bible, is often used to really scare people and to scare hoots out of people. This is typical of the virus of Christian dispensationalism inspired by a man named John Nelson Darby, a 19th century Bible teacher whose teachings were further popularized in the early 20th century in the United States in Europe due to the wide circulation of the Schofield Reference Bible. I grew up with the Schofield Reference Bible. It, not to be confused with the new international version, or the new revised standard version. It was a version, but it had a lot of sort of explanations of almost every text in the Bible. It was like a Bible commentary, if you will, with a focus on this language of dispensationalism. 
Now, I'd like to make it very, very clear, very abundantly clear, I believe in a second coming of Christ. By that I mean that just the way there was a first coming on one Christmas morning, there will be, there will be in some cosmic time and space and place, Christ shall come again. This is why when we read the Lord's Prayer, we read and say, the kingdom come, thy kingdom come, right? We say that all the time. And when we celebrate communion, we often hear the first Corinthian uh, version, chapter 11 version of the words of institution that say, for as often as you eat this bread and drink of the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death. What does it say at the end? Until he comes. Until he comes. There was this expectation in the early church of this coming, this parousia, this advent return in some cosmic time and space and place. But that belief that I have about a second advent is tempered by a clear understanding that today's reading is a literary form, a style that falls among different styles in the Bible called apocalypticism. Apocalypticism. That's where we, in Spanish, revelation is translated apocalipsis, meaning an unveiling of something. This kind of language, this, this, this form of writing is found in Matthew quite a bit, somewhat present in Mark. Less in Luke and almost non-existing in the Gospels, or rather the Gospel of John. This fascinating concept of apocalypticism is simply a literary genre. Point. Put a period on that. That has origins in the ancient world, found in the Hebrew Scriptures, common in the time of Jesus, and seen sparingly in the Christian Scriptures or New Testament. One careless way of reading this material is the fantasy of what I alluded to earlier, dispensationalism. A neatly packaged te te teaching with a fetish for language about, in other, among other components, talk about a, 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 the end of the world, a rapture, an antichrist, a false prophet, a final battle, a future judgment in a new heaven and a new earth. I'm willing to take the initial portions of the end of something, we don't know exactly what, could be the whole universe, the whole planet, at some cosmic time and place. But I also add a new earth and a new heaven. Those two ideas are beautiful. Everything in between is fantasy. Dispensationalism is nothing more than an attempt to repackage ancient apocalyptic literature to scare people to Christ. I grew up in that stuff. I grew up in that in my earliest fundamental roots. And I, you know, I celebrate them. You all remember Pastor Barton would often tell his own stories and experience in the Southern Baptist experience or in the fundamentalist experience of which he came out of, well, he and I have a lot in common. That's why, in part, I love them very much. Because we understood that this thing, fundamentalism, fundamentalism, has a way of scaring people away and creating stuff that need not be there. It doesn't involve the scriptures, but sometimes we've made it out to be as such. Rather than rather than making people come to a Christ who embraces all. They do that, this kind of language, dispensationalism, trying to interpret this particular chapter and other similar like it, are, 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 are tempting to do something that doesn't exist in scriptures. 
It isn't part of scripture. It's merely metaphor and a type of language in the Bible to explain the hope that lies within all of us of some better world someday. That's why the first, the first word in the first Sunday at Advent that we celebrate the first Sunday at Advent is the word hope. There's a hope of something greater and better for us. And that is beautiful. So my invitation, my invitation is that when we think of Advent and when we think of a second coming, when we think of what it means, first Advent, second Advent, that we see it as God desiring relationship with the world so that those who follow this Christ do the following. We, we feed human bellies. That we stand up for the oppressed, that we set the captives free, that we care for our vulnerable planet, that we speak truth to power, and living out Jesus to bring hope in the world. Hope, hope again. Hope, not only from a first advent, but from a second advent to come someday. And we await the mystery of a second advent. Where again, as we're reminded by the writer of Revelations, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the older order of things has passed away. And that's what really this thing called Advent is all about. Inviting us to reimagine a God who desires relationship with creation that brings hope in the world. So Christmas, Advent, is not about presents. We all know that as adults in this room. It's about hope in something greater, in a world that is presently just as beautiful and even more beautiful in a second coming in some point in time and space. So, brothers and sisters, I end with this invitation or exclamation. Jesus is coming. And this Advent season, we once again recall his first coming as we're reminded of his second coming. So, the call of the writer in this chapter is be ready. Be awake. Walk in Christ, not in some perfection you cannot attain, no, I can attain, but in ever-growing holiness. That's W-H-O-L-I-N-E-S-S. -S, that kind of holiness. Balanced with extravagant grace and the embrace of all. That's Advent in a nutshell. That's what today's start of this Advent season is all about. To call us, to call us and to remind us that there is hope on Christ alone, the solid rock. Yes, there are the ways of viewing God, absolutely. But as a follower of Jesus, I stand on the truth that I can stand on a solid rock of hope. And that hope is, for me, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. Thank you, Pastor Louise. I too was in that environment. I can still see my father as a pastor with that huge, I think, 12 foot chart of dispensationalism preaching on it. So I know that. And I know 
what I call liberation from that. And the call that Pastor Louise has just given to us is something that resonates with me as I enter this and still carry that sense of thanksgiving that we just went through. And I think that thanksgiving must be sustained. So I'm going to start off with three things for which I am particularly thankful because it's that, rest, it's that renewal of the call of our Creator to hear in every form of life where He's calling us. So I am thankful for that sister spider who wove that beautiful web that I almost destroyed, but who reminds me that it's sometimes those delicate, fragile, parts of our life that are very important, just like that web reduces the mosquitoes that can bite me. And I'm thankful for that vast family of Mexican petunias that surround my house that are so invasive, like I am at times, that remind me that even for a day, they are beautiful. And I also am so particularly thankful for that brother squirrel who hung on that screen door of my lanai, chattering at me incessantly, trying to awaken me to whatever he needed me to hear. And it was basically, pay attention, learn my language, feel thy awe of creation, be humble enough to know that you don't have everything and you don't have all the knowledge and be, gratitude, be filled with gratitude for how I come to you. And I close with particularly a prayer that I think that ushers us out of this sacred place into a world that needs to hear us. It's the prayer of Black Elk, the great holy man of the Ogala Sioux who died in 1950 who was a part of the battle of the Little Bighorn. But he was a, not only a native spiritual leader, but he was also a very devout Roman Catholic Christian. Hear his prayer of thanksgiving. Learn to hear my feeble voice at the center of the sacred hoop you have said that I should make the tree to blossom with tears running, O great spirit. With running eyes, I must say that the tree is not blooming. Here I stand and the tree is withered. Again, I recall the great vision that you gave to me. It may be that some little root of that sacred tree still lives. So nourish it, that it may have leaf, that it may bloom, that it may fill with singing birds. Hear me, great spirit, that these people may once again find the good road and the shielding tree. Amen.